APA, the theme was lifestyle psychiatry, and there were a lot of talks on metabolic psychiatry, basically the in intersection of metabolic health and mental health. And, and this, was, this has been a topic at APA for several years where there's a subset of people with treatment-resistant depression that just treating insulin resistance treats their depression not even giving them an antidepressant, just treating their insulin resistance, which is fascinating. And so I've started assessing insulin resistance and metabolic status in any patient I have with treatment resistant depression. Basically cardiometabolic disorders are disproportionately high in psychiatric patients and it's bi-directional. It seems it seemed to be causal in a bi-directional way that insulin resistance causes psychiatric issues and that psychiatric issues make it more likely someone is going to have insulin resistance. And that's not even counting that a lot of the medications we prescribe cause insulin resistance. That's even a separate issue. But it seems like a subset of depression, probably treatment-resistant depression, because if, it, if, treat, if any of person's work, they would have worked, is the root cause is metabolic dysfunction. This is just the predominance of the incidence of metabolic, cardiometabolic dysfunction in the general population, bipolar disorders, and then schizophrenia psychotic disorders. So even in those without diabetes, higher fasting insulin predicts future depression and a worse course of insulin, a worse course of insulin. And then re reversing insulin resistance stabilizes mood in these subsets of patients. This is like the TL TLDR is I started evaluating metabolic status in all of my patients with these issues, bipolar disorder, treatment resistant depression and schizophrenia. The other thing I would say was that it's cognitive dysfunction, Alzheimer's disease or early cognitive impairment. The saying is that it's type three diabetes. Alzheimer's disease is type three diabetes. And there's, I'll show you some of this kind of interesting research that was presented at APA about treating insulin resistance to treat Alzheimer's disease. So, it, so I would tr test it in as well. So you're assessing metabolic syndrome. And I will, I will actually, I'm basically virtual, but I'll have the patient measure their waist circumference at home and email me the number. And waist circumference over 40 inches for men and over 35 inches for women is one tick in the box. Second tick is elevated triglycerides. So I'll obviously order a fasting lipid panel. Third tick is low HDL in men that's under 40 in women that's under 50. Next tick is elevated blood pressure over 129 over 84, like 130 over 85, that or higher. So I'll have pa patients either report to me what it was at their PCP appointment or do it like a home blood pressure cuff. And the last is increased fasting glucose. So in terms of the labs, this is what I would order. A fasting lipid panel, a hemoglobin A1C, a homocysteine, a high uh, HSCRP, highly sensitive CRP. And then I've started ordering fasting insulin on these patients as well, because fasting insulin is more sensitive than hemoglobin A1C is for metabolic dysfunction and for insulin resistance. It's like the, it's the earlier, you'll start to see fasting insulin go up before you start seeing hemoglobin A1C go up. So I'll order that as well. And if you have a patient who is, has got metabolic syndrome, is elevated on some of these markers, and has treatment-resistant depression or bipolar disorder, I would, some of this is the obvious stuff, but I'll get to the more interesting stuff in a second, plant-based or Mediterranean diet. I put ketogenic diet in question mark because this is Chris Palmer. It's this guy, psychiatrist out of Harvard, has done this really interesting research about the ketogenic diet by itself treating completely irretractable treatment resistant depression, irretractable schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, even reversing Alzheimer's disease. That's more Dale Bredesen, another guy, another, I don't know if he's a psychiatrist or neurologist, but the, practically the ketogenic diet is basically impossible to implement. It's impossible to implement in practice and you have to have so much willpower and your life has to revolve around it. And it's not without side effects. Like you have to People tend to have like muscle wasting and other issues, so it can be effective, but let's start with the low hanging fruit, like obvious stuff first, plant-based Mediterranean diet, exercise, getting patients up to at least 150 minutes a week of moderate activity. But here's the interesting part. Prescribing, I've started doing this, prescribing metformin or pioglitazone for depression in these patients. I put GLP-1's question mark because there's the like semiglutide or Zempic, Manjaro, those medications, there's interesting research on using GLP-1s for treatment-resistant depression. 
there, it's not a much, as much research that's come out yet. So what absolutely has been studied is using metformin and pioglitazone for depression and metformin and bipolar disorder. There's this really big study, TRIO BD study, that evaluated the efficacy of metformin and bipolar disorder in that subset of patients with bipolar disorder who had insulin resistance. And then the potential cognitive benefits as well, including in schizophrenia. Now this is really interesting. Intranasal insulin, because insulin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. That's like the whole thing. So how do you treat insulin resistance in the brain? They're studying intranasal insulin for cognitive dysfunction for early Alzheimer's disease. I just thought that was completely fascinating. Because what's so interesting about this is that whatever we think is causing Alzheimer's disease, we're wrong. This whole plaques and tangles thing. There's been so many research studies and new, this is going to be the breakthrough, this reverses the tangles, and it doesn't actually treat the symptoms. So every treatment approach around addressing neurofibrillary tangles and plaques as a causal factor in Alzheimer's disease has failed. And so the idea of a completely different mechanism, different path, I think it just is really fascinating. And they're also studying GLP-1s for Alzheimer's disease. But here's the dosing if you're using these for depression, which is basically, it's the same as if you're using them for diabetes. In my, if me personally doing this, I'd probably start on the low end. I might even start with 250 milligrams of metformin a day and a patient I think is going to be sensitive to the GI side effects. This metformin absolutely causes GI side effects, diarrhea, constipation, just stomach upset, but your body gets used to them pretty quickly. I might, like I said, start lower. And then pioglitazone, the dosing range for most of the studies for depression is in the 15 to 30 milligrams a day range, but going up to 45, but I would start at 15. Let me just talk about the GLP ones really quick, because this I think is really fascinating. I'm sure a lot of us have like anecdotal data of patients improve their mood improving with GLP ones. This is what they're being studied for and what there's already some research for. Treatment resistant depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Again, anything that where insulin resistance is a feature or a factor or root cause of it then cognitive dysfunction or early cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease, weight gain associated with psychiatric medications. You know how we all have patients where the Seroquel is the only thing that works for them or the Olanzapine or what, whatever the medication is, it really works for them, but it causes metabolic side effects and weight gain. Using GLP-1s for those patients, I think it's very appropriate. Binge eating disorder, it's absolutely being studied for binge eating disorder. And then substance use disorders. Really interesting research for opiate use disorder, alcohol use disorder, and nicotine use disorder. These were three of the TOX APA, using GLP-1s for nicotine, GLP-1 agonists for alcohol, and GLP-1s for opiate use disorder. And some of the research is, I'm not going to go over this in like a ton of detail, but some of the research is animal studies, but there's human trials for all of this as well. Anecdotally, there's a lot of patients where they were prescribed a GLP-1 for weight loss, and then they just stopped drinking. They just stopped using whatever the substance was. So lots of anecdotal data on that. This is, I think, is really interesting. Data for opiate use disorder. Just This is just showing the effect of liraglutide on the daily desire for drugs. Obviously, no liraglutide over to the left, liraglutide over to the right. It's lower. But here's what I think is really interesting that is seems to be applicable to the use of GLP-1s across all mental health conditions. What this is showing is that the low dose was equally as effective as the medium dose and the high dose. It seems like for the psychiatric indications, the lowest dose is actually equally effective. You do not have to be on a weight loss dose for it to have the benefits for the mental health or mood benefits. And I actually have, anecdotally have a few patients, normal weight patients who are prescribed a GLP-1 for various reasons. One person who was prescribed it for an inflammatory condition, I didn't even know that was a use. And they just describe their mood being so much better. And I have this one patient, She it makes me want to take a GLP-1 low dose. She's in her 60s. Oh, I just started re remembering every day of my life for every decade of my life in detail for the last 40 years, like in specific conversations and specific whatever. 
I'm like, I can you sum up that? And so I, mean, I have not yet prescribed a GLP-1 for a patient, but after I was putting together this talk, I'm thinking I need to start prescribing them. I don't actually even know though, like logistically, how you give someone a lower dose that's lower than what comes in the syringe. Are they just splitting the syringe? Like I just have to look it up. I don't know the answer. Or There's some of the, some compounded ones, but now that there's not as many shortages, you, it's harder to get the compounded because that was just a temporary allowance while there was severe shortages. It, anecdotally, it's I don't know what other people have found or heard. It, it seems like trizepatide is the one that is most likely to have the mood benefits, the mood and cognitive benefits, as opposed to semaglutide or trizepatide is Manjaro and Zepbound. As opposed to Zempic or semaglutide, it seems like more likely it doesn't really have a benefit or in terms of mood or people feel a little dull. Again, that's incredibly anecdotal and of just a handful, but I've had other psychiatrists say that same thing. So with my patients who are getting GLP-1s and they have a mood issue, I'd say, hey, if it's equivalent to your doctor prescribing this, I would recommend terzepatide if you have a choice. What this just shows is that the way that the GLP-1s work for substance use disorders is that this is like the morning is the left and the evening is to the right. It's like when you run out of your own willpower is when it works. In the morning when you have willpower, like it's about the same, cravings are about the same. It's at the end of the day when you run out of your personal willpower that when you're using the GLP-1, it's like doing it for you. So I just thought that was an interesting thing. So it's a particularly effective during times of high risk. And it, in this case, it's particularly effective when administered with medication-assisted therapy and at the lowest dose. Basically the same story with GLP-1s and alcohol. There's this really big study, vet, Veterans Aging Cohort Study, where it, it was just an EHR chart review. It looked at people who just happened to be prescribed GLP-1 agonist for weight or diabetes or some other reason, and then what was their reported alcohol use, and it went down. So interesting correlational study. I feel like I need to learn how to start prescribing these. Now, again, they're still relatively early days of these drugs. They're not without side effects. Some of the side effects we don't really know because what happens, do you need to be on it forever? Do, does the benefit just reverse when you stop it? There's When people are losing weight from them, there's risk that they're losing more of their muscle as opposed to losing fat. They tend to lose both and then you would be especially cautious about an older patient where already their muscle mass is a little bit lower. Basically anyone who's over 30, your muscle mass starts going down. So just wanting to be cautious in patients where you don't want them to be having muscle loss, that's hard to get back. It's obviously not first line. The patients we're thinking about for this are those who, like other things aren't working and they don't have time to wait for there to be like 20 years of research data. So the way I'm thinking about it is using metformin, using pioglitazone for those patients with treatment resistant depression and for the patients with substance use disorder, or maybe the metformin pioglitazone doesn't work, or what was the other one? Binge eating disorder, or weight gain from psychiatric medications where you can't switch the medication, like actually considering recommending these for patients at the low dose, because it seems like the low dose is as effective.